Thank you for taking the time to view this message online. You can connect with us more through our comment section of this video, through our Facebook page, or through our website, nhgj.org. In our message series on the book of Revelation, we've been looking at the book through the lens that it is a book about worship. Now, we know that it's about many other things as well, but really the, the focus, a lot of it, is about the worship and the worship of Jesus Christ. The idea of Revelation is that something, the word Revelation in general, is that something at one point was covered, but now the curtain is pulled back and we see it more fully. It's similar to a sculpture uh, that's going to be revealed, but has a cloth covering over it. We know that something is there and we have a sense of what it is, but until the, it, the curtain's pulled back or the, the veil is pulled back, we really don't know for certain what it is. For example, uh, I'm holding something here. Uh, you know that it's not a car. Uh, you, you know it's something of scale and proportion here, but you don't know fully what it is until I pull it back and it's revealed. So I've given you a revelation of what was in my hand. So it's really a similar idea when we talk about the book of Revelation, that we are uh, seeing, seeing behind the curtain. We, we, we already know something about who Jesus is. We know something about his glorification in heaven. But John, as it's revealed to him and he shares with us, what it is that it looks like that the glory of Jesus as it's revealed in heaven. And so this uh, revelation that, that comes to John, he shares it with the churches early on in his time frame. And we can even fast forward now to 2021. And for those who profess faith in Jesus Christ, we're provided more clarity around what it looks like when Jesus assumes his rightful place as Lord and King over heaven and earth. And so we've been looking at Revelation through that lens. We began with John having a vision of Jesus and this vision that John has in, in Revelation chapter one, it literally puts him face down. He fell at the feet of Jesus as though dead. It was so awe-inspiring and powerful, this vision of Jesus and his power and strength. We then read the letters that were addressed to each church, the, the seven churches in, in Asia Minor, uh, the most prominent churches in that area at that time. And it reminded us that Jesus both knows and is with his church, his, his bride, as the scripture re, uh, refers at times to the church as his bride. And, and so Jesus knows his people, he knows their situations, uh, he knows their strengths, their weaknesses, the hardships they're going through, and also that he is in the midst of the church. He is in uh, the midst of the church and he is able to see her through everything that the church goes through. Well, in the last message, we're invited to the throne room of heaven, Revelation chapter four and five. And this is possibly one of the most unexpected twists so far in the book of Revelation. Uh, it, it's one of those that, uh, as John is recounting what he saw, it is just startling. It catches us off guard. There is a scroll with seven seals in the right hand of God who is seated on the throne. And there is a search for someone worthy to open the seals of the scroll. But no one is found. They look everywhere. They cannot find anyone who is worthy to take the scroll and open its seals until as we read in Revelation chapter five, verses five and six, then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Everything had stopped. There was nobody worthy. And then all of a sudden, wait, it's the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He has triumphed. He is able. And so John is expecting to turn and see this lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He turns and it's the slain lamb standing at the center of the throne. 
a complete switch. He's completely caught off guard by this. It's an image where we, like John, think we know what's about to be revealed to us. It's going to happen before our eyes. We're going to see this lion from the tribe of Judah, but we don't. If everything's about to happen that's written in the scroll and we need a person, see, John sees the scroll and he knows that this this great um, uh, judgment is coming upon the earth, right? That requires somebody who is a strong and, and violent and aggressive person to, to take hold of this power and overcome the world. And, and so we, like John, think we're going to see this great, powerful, and awesome picture that we saw in chapter one, this one who is just so powerful and is ready to just take action upon the earth. But as this is revealed before our eyes, we make this shift from thinking that he's going to come back and win the victory over the world. And instead we shift in this picture of the slain lamb. And we go from this picture of a violent one or thinking it's going to be someone who's aggressive. And we're reminded, we're brought back to that point and we're reminded that he already won the victory. He is the only one who has waged war over sin and death and has resurrected. There is no battle to take place. It's just the victory that's going to be enforced. And so when we see the lamb, we're reminded of that, that the victory has already been accomplished. That's exactly what we're seeing from here on out. We're going to spend most of our time in this message on Revelation chapter 7. And a proper interpretation of Revelation is not that there's going to be this cataclysmic war that's going to be waged in some time in the future between God and Satan, but rather the good and proper perspective is that the, the decisive and total victory has already been won by Jesus Christ when he, God in the flesh, died and resurrected. He won the battle. He already won it. It was a total victory. It is the slain lamb on the throne because it is finished. When we think that there's some great battle to still be played out, we diminish the total victory that Jesus has already accomplished. There is no strong man showing up to win the day. Jesus is not going to ride in on the white horse, slashing with his sword and fighting demonic forces on his way to victory. It is already finished, done. There's nothing else that needs to happen. That means that we see in chapter 6 when the seals are opened and it's really an enforcement of the victory that's already taken place. This is the story of Revelation going forward. We're given a picture of Jesus as this magnificent one in chapter 1 and we just entered the throne room in 4 and 5 and now he's the slain lamb. And it's because he, the great one, the son of God, uh, God in the flesh was willing to die, but also more, most powerful and capable of resurrecting, that he is the one who is going to enforce the victory. So, in other words, wherever Jesus is not Lord and King, without his rule and reign, havoc reigns upon the earth and the people of the earth. This is what happens in Revelation chapter 6, as the, the scroll, the seals to the scroll are opened up and one after another, we see havoc released upon uh, the earth. And, and this isn't the great cataclysmic battle. This is the enforcement of the victory that Jesus already won. It's the, the clearing out of the earth from every other type of idolatry, every other place where Jesus is not uh, recognized as king then the, the judgment and the decision is made to clear out uh, that place to enforce his victory. Well, we come to chapter 7, and this is where I'll spend the rest of this message. So let's pray and then uh, read from Revelation chapter 7. Lord, thank you. We just get so excited, Lord, opening up your word and just realizing how much you've accomplished, how you've conquered, how you've already won. And so, Lord, it, it just... Uh, God, it ignites a passion within us to see you glorified now because we know you. Those who call you Lord and Savior, we know you are king and that your kingdom has come. And we want to see your kingdom come upon all the earth. Lord, not with 
great violence and, and not by terrorizing people, but Lord, by bringing uh, people into the freedom of your kingdom and seeing your righteousness established in people's lives. And so, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word and to, Lord, allow it to speak to us and to change us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation 7, verses 1 through 17. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of, tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. After this, I looked. And there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Oh, it's a beautiful passage, you know, an amazing picture of believers in Christ all around the throne. And it begins with the instruction of holding back the judgment that's going to take place until everyone who is in Christ is sealed. Now, when we hear seal, we think of stamps and branding and so it's kind of an uncomfortable image that they're going to be stamped or they're, they're going to be sealed. But really this points to the Holy Spirit who is deposited in every follower of Jesus. Ephesians 1.13 says it this way, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So the instruction to those carrying out the purifying of the earth from idolatry, the instruction is to wait until the full number is sealed, which then points to 144,000. Now, this is really 12 times 12,000. The 12 tribes times 12,000 gets us to that 144,000. Now, if you're a fan of Hero, what this is pointing to is the idea of a super tribe. Uh, it's not really just a 144,000. There's actually some uh, groups out there, religious groups similar to the Jehovah's Witnesses. They teach that this is literally, this is only 144,000 who are in heaven at this point. Uh, and this, this isn't, that's not a good interpretation of this. This is uh, the fullness, 12 times 12,000. It's, it's the full number, it's the full tribe. And so it's symbolic of this idea that 
that we got to wait until this judgment is carried out, until the whole number is reached, until the whole tribe, the whole family of God is there. Jesus uh, pointed to it this way in Matthew 24, 14. He said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And, and so Jesus, pointing to the same idea, he says, listen, the gospel goes throughout the whole earth until the fullness of all of those who are in the family of God hear and make their allegiance known before the end comes. If I was to put it in modern vernacular, it would be something like, we wanna wait until the family is all here, all safe, and then it's time to put the earth in proper order and make it ready for the king and his people. And so that's, that's what this is pointing to, the 144,000 wait until everybody who is making a decision that Christ is king, he is the Lord of heaven and earth, once that number is full, then the judgment comes, then the earth is made right and it's put in its right order. So, you know, really the way to think about this and, and, and just because we don't know the day and the hour is that because we don't know the day or hour, but we know that it won't happen until all peoples have heard and the last of our family says, Jesus is Lord, right? So in, in the kingdom of God, none of the family of God gets left behind and, and is, is faced as under this judgment. And, and so what happens is we're waiting for that full number, the full tribe to be accounted for before uh, the, the judgment is placed and the, the preparation is made upon the earth to get it ready for the king and his people. Once John sees that this full count of God's family, a, a total is accounted for, that the whole family of God is there, a worship service breaks out. Uh, John says he sees that 144,000 and then all of a sudden uh, there's just too many count from every nation, every tribe, people, and language. There's just a huge celebration that breaks out in heaven. This is why, and, and there's an emphasis put on, they specifically mention every nation, tribe, people, and language. You, if you've been around New Horizons, you know that I love talking about this. I love that we are people who celebrate the diversity within the body of Christ. Uh, this is why uh, I, I never say we don't see color. You'll hear me say we absolutely see and value every color. We see and, and hear every language and we celebrate every language. We celebrate diversity because the more colors, the more languages, the more customs, the more culture, the more glory that gets lifted up to Jesus Christ. And, and so we, we don't say, I, we're all the same. We're, we're, everybody's the same. There's, we don't see color, we just see people. Can I tell you at New Horizons, that's, that's not our motto. We don't say that, we don't function that way. We celebrate black, white, we celebrate Native American, we celebrate Asian Americans, we celebrate Asians apart from America, uh, Hispanics, South Americans, Africa. I mean, just go around the whole world, right? Uh, it, it's his, this is God's world um, and, and we're his people. Every human being is made in his image and we celebrate that he has made people from every nation, tribe, people, and language. And the reason we celebrate it is because he celebrates it. It's in Revelation. He wants to remind us. In fact, it was in the throne room. It was brought up there. It's brought up again here in seven. It'll be brought up again and later on in Revelation because we have to, we're called to, we, we want to celebrate that there's people all around the world of, of every place that recognize that Jesus is Lord and King. In Babylon, uh, in the world systems, they say all must become the same, right? This is their approach is talk the same, think the same, dress the same. Uh, everybody needs to be one group. And so we see this over and over in world history. Every time there's prominence to power, it's pushing people into one language, one way of acting, one way of thinking. And so we're in contrast to that. God's family says all people are in his image, so we celebrate that. Now, partway into this worship celebration, an elder turns and asks John, he says, who are these? Who is this multitude that no one can count? But John puts it back to him. He says, sir, you know. <laughs> in other words, John's like, I, I'm the new guy here. I don't know what's, where all these people came from. 
And here it is, Revelation 7, 14, the elders response back to him. He said, these are they who have come out of great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Now, this is sometimes where you get the word tribulation, the great tribulation is where you get some people saying, oh, well, this is where you get pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib is that there's the sequence of events and that God is going to take out all this great multitude off of the earth. Well, it, it's not suggesting here, it's not trying to suggest that it's just this one moment and then all of a sudden there's these people who are taken out of this great tribulation moment. It's pointing to these are people who have come out of difficulty. They've come out of hardship. They've come out of great pain and suffering. The reality is that this could actually be speaking about every person who has lived on the earth. All of these are those of us who have gone through life here on the earth where we faced some type of hardship, sickness and death and disease, and we faced life where Jesus is not the ultimate, um, uh, the final voice in things, that we have oppression and hard things. And so this is, this is what uh, the elder is speaking to. He says, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So the question, how did all these people get here? How did this happen? Well, they washed their robes, not in what we would typically think would make them clean, but instead they washed them in the blood of the lamb who was on the throne. And this points to the final thing that I want to highlight out of this passage in Revelation 7 is that the only reason any person will be in the presence of God is because the blood of Jesus Christ was offered and they chose him for their redemption. John hears these words and the passage finishes with a testimony of what they will experience because they're with him. And this is a great place to really finish our time together as well. How did all of these people, John is asked, the elder says, how did these people get here? John says, I don't know. And the elder says, here's how they got here. Because redemption was offered to them through the blood of Jesus Christ. Salvation, life in Christ was offered to make Jesus Lord and King. And they said, yes, that's who my Lord and King is. He's the one that I want to follow. He's the one how this is, this is my way of finding redemption is through Jesus Christ. As we finish in this message, I want to make that invitation. If you are thinking about eternity, if you're thinking about your life, who is Lord? Who is King? What does it look like to, to live on the earth with a, a true Lord and King who someday will set all things right? What does it look like in the future knowing that there comes a time when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Do you want to make that decision under the, the forced, uh, it, it, the enforcement of angelic hosts and those who are putting the earth right and making it ready for Jesus to come back? Or do you want to make that decision just on your own? Do you want to be able just to say, you know what, I don't want to be forced to say it. I want to just confess Jesus is Lord on my own. I want not my righteousness to make my way into heaven, but I want the righteousness of Jesus. Well, you can do that. I, can, I want to invite you to do that. At the end of this message, there's an invitation to receive a little booklet that we send out to those who make that decision. It's called Following Jesus. And uh, we pass it along to you with no cost. And uh, I, I want to be able to give this to you. If you're making that decision today to follow Jesus, um, you know, this, there's no better thing you could do today than just to say, I want to be in the, his presence. I want to be part of that worship ceremony that John saw as the full tribe, the super tribe comes together to worship the lamb. It's the only way you get in. It's the only way that you're in the presence of God is by confessing Jesus as Lord and making him king. For those of you who have made that decision, the encouragement is here. The one thing that he wants, whether from Genesis to Revelation, the one thing that God has talked about over and over, his unending desire is he says, I will be your God and you will be my people. In fact, this portion that we just read said, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I want to close just by encouraging you, take heart, 
hold on to hope because it, it, it may not be in this moment. You may, you may not experience it with your last breath here on earth that Jesus returns, but you will see that moment. You will get to be part of that great multitude who worships before the throne of God as Jesus himself, the lamb, will be your shepherd. What a, what a wonderful time. What an amazing time that will be to worship around the throne of God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. We, we are so thankful for this uh, revelation, this peeling back of what it looks like in heaven when the whole tribe is together, the whole family of God. We want to be there, Lord. So thank you for drawing us. Thank you for uh, sealing us with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for including us and and Lord, giving us the opportunity to wash our robes, not in our righteousness that is, that is not pure, not in our acts of service, which isn't enough, but allowing us to wash our robes in your blood, making us holy and clean. We thank you so much. Lord, we, we do worship you. We don't wait till we get to heaven. We start today to worship you and to give you the praise that you are worthy of. Thank you, God. Thank you for leading the way. And we look forward to that time of being before your throne with every other believer, every nation, tribe, language, and people. God, we so love you, Jesus. You are the worthy, worthy one of God. Amen. You can find more resources for this service at nhgj.org. Email us your prayer requests to prayer at nh4gj.org. If you are a new follower of Jesus, we have a free resource for you called Following Jesus. To receive a copy, send a request to info at nh4gj.org. If you would like to partner with our ministry through giving, you can do that online at nhgj.org giving or by mail to 641 Horizon Drive, Grand Junction, Colorado, 81506. Thank you for being with us and may the Lord bless you.